Hello, my name is Sean, also known as Kyle, and this is Arch Linux System Installation. This tutorial will be utilizing the ISO image that was released on December 1st, 2012. Following the Arch Linux philosophy, these tutorials are geared at being simple and efficient. Okay, let's begin. You should now place the copy of the Arch Linux image you burned to a disk in your machine and reboot. If you need to enter BIOS to enable booting from a disk instead of the primary hard drive, please do so at this time. Now you should be looking at the Arch Linux boot menu. From this menu, select the boot option that corresponds to your architecture type, x86 underscore 64 for 64-bit, and i686 for 32-bit. Given that I have a 64-bit machine, I will select the first option, boot Arch Linux x86 underscore 64. Your system will now begin the boot up process. Once finished, you will be greeted by the console. You may also notice that you have been automatically logged into the root account. In order to fully install Arch, we will have to first set up the hard drives, then install the base system, then install the bootloader, and lastly, configure the system. Please note, before we begin, if you are using a keyboard with a non-US key map, you'll need to specify which key map to load before continuing. To pull up a list of all the key maps, issue the command ls space forward slash usr forward slash share forward slash kbd forward slash key maps. Organization is laid out in directories as machine type forward slash keyboard type. If you take the name of the map.gz file without the path or file extension, you can then plug that into the command load keys. For example, to load a key map for the United Kingdom using a QWERTY keyboard on an i386-based machine, you would use load keys space UK. First, we'll start by setting up the hard drive we will be using for the Arch installation. You can get a list of all the disks in your system by performing the fdisk space l command. You can safely ignore the three on the bottom that begin with forward slash dev, forward slash mapper, as those are mounted off the live disk image you are using and are not physical drives. Once you have located the drives you will be using for Arch, mark down the device nodes the disks use. As more and more people nowadays are starting to utilize the power of solid state disks, or SSD, I will be using that as a baseline for my disk setup. Therefore, in my system, I will be using two disks forward slash dev, forward slash SDA and forward slash dev forward slash sdb. The first being the SSD and the latter being a SATA disk. If you are installing Arch in a dual boot configuration with Windows already installed on one of your disks, you can easily locate this by looking for the disk or disks that contain the HPFS forward slash NTFS forward slash EXFAT partitions. Now that we've located the disks we will be installing Arch to, issue the CF disk command on the SSD. Now as far as partition information goes, this tends to be one of those areas where everyone has their own opinion on how things should be laid out. I for one am a firm believer in using what you are comfortable with, so if you have a setup you typically like to use, then by all means. That being said, I will walk you through setting up a couple baseline partitions. We will be creating the root and boot partitions on the SSD, and then creating the swap, var, and home partitions on the SATA disk. If you're installing this onto a single SATA disk or inside a virtual box, feel free to use only the root, boot, and swap partitions, yet all on the same disk. To navigate around CF disk, use the left and right arrow keys to select a command, and you can use the up and down arrow keys to select which partition and or the free space. Let's put this into action. You should see CF disk with a single line in the table saying your disk is all free space. If this is not the case, and you had previously used this disk for something else, first confirm that this is indeed the disk you wish to wipe before continuing. If you are positive that this is the disk you want, select each existing partition one at a time and use the delete option. Now that we have a blank partition table, let's make a boot partition. Select new, make it a primary partition, Tell it to size to 512 megabytes, and place it at the beginning of the free space. You will then notice the new partition selected. 
Make this a bootable partition by choosing the option Bootable. You should notice under the Flags column that the partition receives the flag Boot. Now we can create our root partition. Move down to the free space and choose New. Also make this one primary. And for the size, you can go ahead and just press Enter to select the rest of your disk. Please note that if you are using UEFI, you will most likely need to create another partition to host the UEFI system partition. Please see the link in the description for more information on how to create a UEFI system partition. Now that the disk's partition information is complete, choose the Write option to write the changes to the disk. Also make sure you actually answer with YES for yes, as opposed to Y, as Y is not an option. Then choose Quit in order to return to the console. Then issue the CFDisk command on the SATA disk. Again, cleaning out the disk partitions with the Delete option if needed. The next partition is Swap. If you have a beast of a machine with, say, more than 8GB of RAM, this partition can be skipped. It's entirely up to you. Keep in mind, however, that if you are going to be using Suspend to Disk, better known as Hibernation, a swap file is required and recommended to be at minimum the size of your RAM. If you choose to use a swap partition, select the free space and create a new partition. Make this one a primary partition, size it to the amount desired, and create it at the beginning of the free space. Then with the swap partition selected, move the cursor to the Type option, and select option 82 Linux Swap forward slash Solaris, which should already be selected. Next we can create our VAR partition. This partition stores variable data such as cache files and administrative logs. As such, it has frequent reads and writes, hence leaving it off the SSD. Reselect the free space and create a new partition. Make this one a primary partition as well. Size it to 12,288 megabytes. And place it at the beginning of the free space. Finally, we can create the home partition. Move down to the free space and choose new. Also make this one primary. And for the size, you can go ahead and just press enter to select the rest of the free space. Again, to save the partition table, be sure to choose the Write option. When done, go ahead and select Quit to return to the console. Before we begin formatting the file systems, let's pull up a list of all the partition tables to make sure we issue these commands on the proper disk. To do this, issue the command fdisk space l. You should notice the lines that contain the partitions we created. These names will vary depending on the disk or disks you are installing to, as mine are SDA and SDB, the partitions I need to format are SDA1, SDA2, SDB1, SDB2, and SDB3. First, if you created a swap partition, issue the command mkswap on the device node of the swap partition. Then we can enable paging to the swap file by issuing the command swap on on the device node. You can verify that this took place by issuing the command swap on space dash s. You should see the partition you designated as swap in the list. To format the remaining partitions, we will be using the mkfs command. In order to get a full list of all supported file systems, type in the console mkfs and then press the tab key. For use in Arch, we will be utilizing the ext4 file system. Issue the mkfs .ext4 command on each partition to create the file systems. Also taking into consideration, adding the option dash capital E space discard on the SSD partitions. Now that we have prepared all the partitions and file systems, let's mount them to a temporary directory. First mount the root partition. Issue the command mount space forward slash dev forward slash sda2 space forward slash mnt, substituting sda2 with the partition you created. 
then create a directory for the boot, var, and home partitions to be mounted on with the command mkdir space forward slash mnt forward slash boot space forward slash mnt forward slash var space forward slash mnt forward slash home. And then mount the partition you created as the boot partition by issuing the command mount space forward slash dev forward slash sda1 space forward slash mnt forward slash boot. Again, substituting sda1 with the partition you created. Mount the var partition with the command mount space forward slash dev forward slash sdb2 space forward slash mnt forward slash var. And finally, the home partition with mount space forward slash dev forward slash sdb3 space forward slash mnt forward slash home. Again, substituting sdb2 and sdb3 with the partitions you created. DHCP is loaded at boot and set to default. Therefore, in ideal situations, you should already have internet access. You can test this with the command ping space dash c space three space google dot com. As long as you get a ping back, you are connected. If you need to set up a wireless interface, issue the command Wi-Fi dash menu. After confirming access to the internet, install the base system onto your disk by issuing the command pack strap space forward slash mnt space base. You will next have to decide which bootloader you want to install onto your machine. You have the option of using syslinux or grub2. This choice really comes down to personal preference. However, while syslinux currently has support for UEFI, it is still in the alpha stages and out of the scope of this tutorial. If you need UEFI support, I recommend at least beginning with Grub2. Despite the UEFI concerns, both are fully capable of chain loading other bootloaders, such as NT Loader for dual booting Windows, and having graphical boot menus. In order to install syslinux, you can issue the command pack strap space forward slash mnt space syslinux. In order to install grub2, issue the command pack strap space forward slash mnt space grub dash bios. Replacing grub dash bios with grub dash efi dash x86 underscore 64 for 64 bit UEFI support, or grub dash efi dash i386 for 32 bit UEFI support. Now that we have Arch installed, let's begin configuring the system. First, generate an fstab file with the command gen fstab space dash p space forward slash mnt space greater than greater than space forward slash mnt forward slash etc forward slash fstab. This file is in charge of loading all the required file systems upon boot. If you're using SSD, Recall from earlier using the discard option when creating the SSD file systems. This will have to be duplicated in the fstab file. Using your editor of choice, open up forward slash mnt forward slash etc forward slash fstab. My editor of choice happens to be nano, but feel free to use whatever you are comfortable with. For the mount points, forward slash and forward slash boot, being the SSD partitions, add to the options, comma, discard. Then go ahead and save and exit. In Nano, this can be done with Control X. We can then print the file to the console in order to verify it was written correctly with the command cat space forward slash mnt forward slash etc forward slash fstab. Verify all as well and continue. To proceed, change root into your new system with the command arch dash ch root space forward slash mnt. Once inside the change root, begin by creating the mk init cpio, which is the initial RAM disk file system. Issue the command mk init cpio space dash p space linux.
With that done, we can now configure the bootloader. If you chose syslinux, run the command syslinux dash install underscore update space dash IAM to install syslinux to the MBR and set the boot flag. Then edit the file forward slash boot forward slash syslinux forward slash syslinux.cfg. Make sure under the label arch, the root partition is set to the partition you created for root, which in my case is forward slash dev forward slash sda2. Then save and exit to return to the console. If you chose grub2, run the config command grub dash mk config space dash o space forward slash boot forward slash grub forward slash grub dot cfg. And then install grub2 to the first disk of your system with the grub dash install space forward slash dev forward slash sda, your disk name may vary. The last thing you will need to do inside the change root is to set the root password. You can do this with the passwd command. Then exit out of the change root environment. With the system completely installed, Unmount all of the partitions that you mounted for the installation. Issue the command umount space forward slash mnt forward slash left brace boot comma home comma var right brace space forward slash mnt. And then reboot the machine with system ctl space reboot. Be sure to remove any installation media that you were using to install Arch. You should now see your Grub2 or SysLinux boot menu. And if you wait 5 seconds, Arch should boot itself. Proceed by logging in to the super user account named root with the password you specified previously. Now we can continue configuring the system starting with the hostname. Issue the command hostname ctl space set dash hostname space and then your hostname. For example, I will be using the hostname Arch. Next, we can set up the time zone. To pull up a list of all time zones, issue the command ls space forward slash usr forward slash share forward slash zone info. Using the command again to look inside the folder that represents your country. Take note of the zone and subzone. For me, this happens to be US and Pacific. To set this as default, Issue the command time date ctl space set dash time zone space us forward slash pacific using your zone and subzone accordingly. Now, to set your machine to the appropriate locale, you need to first edit the file forward slash etc forward slash locale dot gen. Uncomment the two lines that correspond to your locale. For me, this happens to be en underscore us space iso dash 8859 1 and en underscore us dot utf dash 8. After confirming your locale is properly set, save and exit. Then generate the needed locales with the locale dash gen command. Finally, issue the command locale ctl space set dash locale space all caps l a n g equals quote e n underscore u s dot u t f dash eight end quote to enable dhcp upon boot issue the command system ctl space enable space dhcp cd at eth zero dot service and then you can start DHCP with the command system ctl space start space DHCP cd at eth zero dot service. The hardware clock is set to UTC by default. The only reason you would ever want to change this is if you were in a dual boot configuration with another operating system that is already managing time and DST switching while storing the time in local time, such as Windows. If doing so, Run the command timedate ctl space set dash 
local dash RTC space true to set the hardware clock to local time. If you're going to use UTC, I recommend you also install the NTP daemon in order to keep your time synced online. To do so, issue the command pacman space dash capital S space NTP to install it, and then systemctl space enable space NTPD dot service in order to enable the service at boot. Now that the system is configured properly, go ahead and reboot again with the command systemctl space reboot. Congratulations, you have successfully installed Arch Linux. Thank you for joining me. Again, I'm Sean, also known as Kyle, and I hope to see you soon.